postdoctoral research on the Lyme disease spirochete at the Tulane National Primate Research Center, TNPRC. She uh, joined the faculty at TNPRC then. Her research program regarding Borrelia burgdorferi and Lyme disease is designed around two major focus, the antibiotic efficacy against Lyme disease and the immune diagnosis. Uh, for the infection and the cure. So without me destroying any more scientific language here, I'm going to bring up the real doctors. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. <laughs> Well, I always describe myself as a, a not the useful kind of doctor, <laughs> the PhD instead of an MD. Um, so I want to thank um, Tammy and Jessica for this the invitation to, to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the immune response in primates, and I'm going to link that to uh, diagnosis, treatment, and, uh, and, and then I'm going to talk about some studies that we have coming up. So, <clears throat> first I'm going to talk about uh, diagnostic testing for Lyme, and um, I'm going to cover again the ways that the spirochetes evade the host immune response. This is what actually got me into this field, because I read this article, and it was about Borrelia and, and a way that they managed to evade the host immune response. And um, this pathogen is extremely good at doing that, and, and, and I'll talk about that. Um, and then we have, I'm going to talk about how the spirochetes can actually directly suppress the immune response and how the ticks can do that as well. Um, and then dis discuss the, uh, the impact of host responses on how effective treatment is. And if any of you have read my recent studies, you know that doxycycline doesn't work very well, um, at least a 28-day course latent infection. And I'm, and I'm not going to really talk about that today, but... Um, and, then, and then I'll talk about our upcoming study. So the, the CDC case definition of Lyme disease is as follows. Uh, the clinical case definition requires um, an erythema migrans rash, and of course it needs to be at least five centimeters in diameter or you don't have Lyme disease, and at least one late manifestation uh, and laboratory confirmation. And we know that... Um, in terms of the, the laboratory confirmation, one easy way is to isolate uh, Borrelia burgdorferi from a skin biopsy or blood, and that happens maybe 10% of the time if you're lucky. Um, and then the demonstration of, of diagnostic levels of IgM or IgG, and we know that this can be highly variable, and I'll talk about that. Or a significant increase in antibody titer between the acute uh, and convalescent serum samples. So uh, right at the point of diagnosis and then later um, in infection. And of course that can be highly variable as well and it depends on what antigens you look at. Um, so this is the, it's a synopsis of two-tier testing for Lyme disease. The first phase is a, an ELISA or um, enzyme immunoassay. And if you have a positive or equivocal result, then that is backed up with a Western blot. And the criteria for interpreting the Western blot are uh, somewhat subjective, and it's uh, really not a very good test, um, especially early in infection. So what we did was we took 10 monkeys and we infected them with the same strain of Borrelia, B31, that's been propagated in the lab, and we infected them by tick bite. And then we monitored their antibody responses to five different antigens. So what you see here, <coughs> each line is one of those antigens, each colored line is one of those antigens, and this is following the antibodies over time. These monkeys were treated, or these monkeys were untreated, and these monkeys were treated. And probably the first thing you're going to notice is this guy up here didn't generate any antibody response. This is all IgG. Nothing. We did IgG westerns, we did IgM westerns, couldn't find anything. This monkey over here generated responses to two of the antigens, but they were gone by 12 weeks. So if you're trying to do a diagnostic test here using antibody, you're not going to pick it up. 
of these monkeys were infected. We infected them. <laughs> um, this monkey did not have much in terms of uh, disease. This monkey, we found spirochetes in its heart. It had a beautiful EM rash. Um, definitely persistently infected. And then if you look at, um, many of you are familiar with the C6 test. One of these lines is C6, this blue line here. And what you can see is that with the um, treated monkeys, you almost always see a decline in the C6 antibody titer. But with the untreated monkeys, some of these declined whether or not they were treated. So they weren't treated and they, the C6 still declined. So if you're trying to do a C6 test here, you're not gonna pick it up. And this is only showing the host vari variability, not the pathogen, because you're using the same pathogen in a genetically variable host. So when it comes to diagnostic testing, variability in the antibody response uh, is, is very important. Um, so the accuracy of, of serological tests depend on the timing of the specimen collection with respect to disease state, the kinetics of antibody expansion. A long time ago, we did a study looking at different antigens um, in monkeys over the course of infection, and we saw that the antibodies fluctuated based on what antigen you were using to look uh, for, for a serodiagnosis. Um, the kinetics, like I said, the kinetics of the antibody response, selecting the proper target antigens, and the methodology. So, currently accepted diagnostic tests rely on a strong and polyspecific antibody response. Okay, so uh, Dr. Baumgarf talked about uh, the, the reservoir host. So the mouse is a reservoir host for Lyme disease, and we know that they fail to clear the infection with Borrelia burgdorferi. This is how it needs to be in nature because the pathogen needs to survive in the host and it needs to transmit itself to the next um, recipient. And mice don't get CNS infection. They don't get um, any brain infection. Uh, they, they don't get very sick and there are a lot of spirochetes in, in the tissues when you look. So that's, that makes sense evolutionarily. But what about primates? So uh, what aspects of this uh, immune evasion and immune suppression that happens in the reservoir host, the mouse, also um, apply to infection of primates? Um, so we know that the persistence happens in primates as well, and clearly there are uh, reasons for this. So what we think, uh, based on some of the research that we've done, is that, that humans and non-human primates are actually dead-end hosts. So they get infected, but they harbor a, a lower level infection and um, induce moderate to significant inflammatory responses depending on a number of factors which we don't really know very well at this point. So like I said, when I, when I first got into this field, it was because I was interested in immune evasion mechanisms. And I, the first thing I did when I joined the lab was to write a review article on immune evasion mechanisms. And, and I separated it into active immune suppression and immune evasion. And so this is the way that Borrelia um, actively uh, suppresses the general immune response, and these are the way that Borrelia hide from the immune response. And so if you look at active immune suppression, you have things like complement inhibition. This is very well characterized. These uh, you know, proteins in the blood that are meant to kill pathogens, Borrelia binds up um, those proteins, degrade, manages to degrade them, so they have no effect. Um, induction of inflammatory cytokines, tolerization of monocytes. So if you take uh, blood cells from a, Lyme, or a Borrelia infected patient and a healthy patient, and you stimulate it with something uh, like lipopolysaccharide, which is a um, component of gram negative bacteria, then you look at the response, the cytokine responses from those uh, cells. The, the cells from the Lyme patients won't generate those responses, but the the cells from the healthy patients will. They won't generate these pro-inflammatory cytokine responses. So there's something, some effect that the Borrelia is having on the cells in general to prevent, um, 
to prevent the induction of inflammation. Um, here's one that we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about or talking about, but this was shown several years ago, the generation of immune complexes. So if Borrelia has antigens that are inducing antibody responses and they shed those antigens, then the antibodies will bind to that antigen that's free in the serum instead of binding to Borrelia. And I think that happens a lot more than we really know. Um, phase and antigenic variation, they change their, uh, their molecular you know, uh, repertoire of lipoproteins. We know that uh, if you infect a mouse and you look at when the immune response comes up, when you see those antibody responses come up, then they change all their surface antigens, or at least a large portion of them. Um, and we also know that they're physically uh, secluded within the body. So they do a lot of things to, to prevent themselves from being recognized. And at the, at the, at the center of uh, the active immune suppression is this cytokine interleukin-10. And this is an immunosuppressive cytokine. And what happens is these are macrophages and dendritic cells. And if you take a wild-type mouse and infect it with Borrelia, you'll see the induction of IL-10. But if you take an IL-10 deficient mouse and infect it with Borrelia, you'll see all these cytokines, TNF-alpha, IL-12, IL-6, that are induced. But if, if the mouse is infected with Borrelia, it's, they're suppressed because of the production of this IL-10 that suppresses the rest of the pro-inflammatory response. So we can't forget about the ticks either because the ticks have very potent saliva and the saliva in the ticks also suppresses the immune response and this has been characterized pretty extensively. And this is just a short list from a review paper. We know that there are proteins that the tick saliva, in the tick saliva that bind to the antigens in Borrelia, uh, like outer surface protein C, one of the most dominant antigens, and it prevents the antibodies from binding to Borrelia. <clears throat> and we don't know how long this immune suppression lasts. Um, we know that the tick can also in inhibit B cell responses. But when those ticks are feeding on you, they're spitting in your bloodstream for a good three or four days. And so how long the immune suppression imparted by the tick saliva um, lasts, we don't really know. <clears throat> so that's, um, that's immune evasion and immune suppression. But what about treatment? How does the immune response affect treatment efficacy? Well, the, the primary uh, antibiotic prescribed for Lyme disease is doxycycline. And this is, oops, and this is a microbiostatic antibiotic. It doesn't kill the bacteria. It relies on a good immune response in order to be efficacious. So if your uh, pathogen is not inducing a good immune response, how can you expect that your microbiostatic antibiotic is going to be effective? Um, we talked about immune, immune evasion. Um, we also know that uh, the, the microbiostatic antibiotic is effect, most effective on actively dividing Borrelia, okay? So Borrelia, however, survive in ticks for many months without dividing. So they're fine in a dormant phase. So what makes us think that they can't be dormant inside a human host as well? Um, and we also know that they can be found deep in connective tissues and you have to think about how well the antibiotic penetrates. So <clears throat> here's um, a result from a study and I'm, I'm sharing this um, I, I, I actually got permission to share this. This is a paper, a manuscript that's um, currently in preparation. And the, these are Lyme patients from uh, John Alcott's slice study where um, these are, uh, this is at the untreated phase and then one month, six months, and two years after treatment with doxycycline. And uh, this group at, at uh, Stanford took the B cells from these patients and looked at the number of plasma blasts, and these are the antibody secreting B cells, and compared those between patients who eventually got better and patients who never got better. And what they found is patients who returned to health had really good 
plasma blast responses. So they had antibody secreting B cells to begin with, and they also had more clonally expanded um, B cells. And those who, patients who didn't get better had, had poorer B cell responses, which makes sense if they're being treated with doxycycline, right? <clears throat> So uh, we, we used our five antigen test again with these same patient samples. And so this is kind of a complicated uh, figure, but these 10 patients returned to health. These 10 patients ended up having post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And we compared their antibody responses to these five different antibodies, um, or to these five different antigens, to a, a Lyme arthritis patient that responded really well to everyone. And what we found is the patients who, I thought the patients who had post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome were gonna be persistently infected and have persistent antibody. No, the patients who ended up with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome had poor antibody responses to begin with. So what we found was that nine of 10 patients that returned to health generated strong um, IgG responses and to two or more antigens. So again, a good polyspecific antibody response. And the patients that were categorized as having post-treatment Lyme um, either showed weak responses or produced uh, a response to this other antigen that we're um, starting to pick up PTLDS patients with in our, in our diagnostic test. Um, so there are a couple of different explanations for this. Uh, the first is host differences and the ability to generate um, humoral responses to, to Borrelia, possibly in the isotype switching. Um, strain differences among Borrelia uh, co-infections. How, how does co-infection affect the, the antibody response? Um, and it could be that antibody responses target other antigens that are not in our assay or that the post-treatment Lyme patients had EM but were not infected. And because all of these were patients that had uh, EM, physician diagnosed EM. So here we are relying on really good antibody responses to both diagnose and treat Lyme disease when we know that there's significant variability among patients. So what, what, what we want to do is test uh, the impact of infection with Borrelia on the incidental host. So we know to some extent what happens in the reservoir host. Um, so now we want to look at non-human primates. And why would we use uh, non-human primates for these studies? Well, we know that they, they closely mimic the multi-organ character of human disease. They get infection of the central nervous system. They oftentimes get a skin rash. Everything that you see in humans, you typically will see in non-human primates. Um, the, the burden in tissues is, is similar to, to what we see in humans. Um, compared to mice, the disease course, duration and quantity of Borrelia in the blood is more similar to that of humans. And of course, uh, compared to human samples, we, can, we know the infection history and we can take tissues out of the monkeys to examine them post necropsy. And we're also going to do lymph node biopsies. <clears throat> So the goal here is to test immune dysfunction um, in non-human primates, and our hypothesis is that infection with Borrelia burgdorferi non-specifically impairs uh, B cell responses. Um, and, but we're also looking a little more globally at the, at the immune response. So we just requested animals. We've gone through all of our approvals, and uh, we're requesting nine four- to five-year-old male rhesus macaques. Um, they'll split, be split into three groups, infected only, immunized and infected, and immunized only. And we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we're going to take a, a, an immunogen that's already been really well characterized in non-human primates. We do a lot of HIV research where I am. So I have a, a collaborator who's an immunologist in HIV. And we're going to immunize them with an HIV-derived um, glycoprotein and we know what the because we know what the immune response should look like when okay when um, the monkeys are uh, immunized with this antigen and then we can look at the impact of Borrelia infection on that immune response. We're going to infect them by tick bite because that's what we love to do <laughs> and we know that tick spit can have an, an effect. Um, so here's the, the experimental protocol. 
we have our monkeys, they're going to be infected, um, and then we'll immunize them and give them boost at, at one and two months post-infection. We're going to take whole blood and lymph node biopsies, and we're going to measure the antibody levels uh, to both the Borrelia burgdorferi antigens and the uh, GP130. Um, we'll do immuno, you know, immunophenotyping, so we're, look at B, we're going to look at B cell populations, T cell populations, and then the functionality. So the functionality of the B cell populations is the production of antibodies, and the functionality of the T cell populations um, is, we'll stimulate them with GP130 peptides and look for interferon gamma production. This is all very well characterized. Um, and, and Hopefully, we'll see some differences between infected and uninfected. <laughs> so, <laughs> with that, uh, I want to thank the members of, of my lab um, and uh, microbiology and veterinary medicine at the Primate Center, our federal funding, and our uh, enormous contributions from foundations. So, thank you. Questions? Thank you, Monica. Um, I had a question regarding the doxy and, and its bacteriostatic nature uh, at 100 milligram BID equivalent to humans. What is your thought on the concept of it being cytal at 200 milligram BID equivalent? Of it being what? Cytal. There are some oh. who suggest that it may take on cytal characteristics at higher dosing. I don't know that there are studies to support that. When you look in vitro, um, it's bacteriostatic at uh, 2.5 micrograms per milliliter, and it takes up to 50 for it to be uh, bactericidal. So that's uh, at least you know 200 times higher doses. Um, and even then, it's, it's kind of not that cytal. So. Just to, I assume that the monkeys that you use are very out for it, right? Yes. Yeah. In fact, uh, they're... Can I just repeat his? Uh, he he, he uh, said he is, the, Dr. Ehrlich, said that he assumes our, our monkeys are outbred. And in fact, uh, we had someone come that studies monkey populations and genotypes them, and they're actually more genetically diverse than we are. <laughs> so yeah, because there was a bottleneck with the human population that didn't happen with the um, monkey population. Just a quick question. What species of uh, Borrelia are you using? Uh, we're actually going to use uh, JD1, which uh, was originally used to characterize the non-human primate model of Lyme disease years ago, and um, it's, it's highly virulent. So we know it causes nervous system disease and arthritis and et cetera, versus B31. We use B31 in these studies because we needed to do all this molecular analysis, and B31 is very well characterized. We have the full genome. Um, but I think JD1 is, is much better for primates. Would you, would you care to comment upon the risks involved, potential risks in blood transfusions and tissue <coughs> in patients who have not been identified as carriers, but in fact do suffer from growth? <laughs> well, we know Babesia is a big problem with blood transfusions because it survives really well. Um, uh, the, the blood populations, as far as I know, are not screened for, for Borrelia. Um, it is. Um, it's actually probably better to get it from blood than from a tick. In a, in a weird way, because um, you, you have a better chance of mounting an, an immune response against the beryllium. So, but I, I actually don't have a lot of <laughs> knowledge of, of that particular topic. Uh, the same model with tissue transplants would also be a carrier. Mm -hmm. It, it could be, yeah, absolutely. In fact, in the mice, that's one way that uh, Dr. Baumgarth trans transfers uh, 
post-adapted spirochetes from one mouse to another by skin transplant. Mm -hmm. So. Are there any safeguards against that? <laughs> like I said, I'm not a useful doctor, so in the, in the lab, <laughs> we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> we have time. All right. Dr. Brown. I just Brown. want to comment. I think the tissue definitely, but it's blood and the likelihood of the transplant being infected True. by blood. It, I mean, you have to be super unlucky to, to do that. Yeah. There's, there's it's not blood-borne for very, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it really, it, I mean, that's the whole problem of the diagnostic. If, if it wasn't the blood, we probably would have a test by now, but it's not. And so I wouldn't be worried about blood transfusion. The tissue is a totally different thing. We have time for one more question. So um, I'm fairly focused on trying to figure out how to find better Lyme diagnostics. And this is a question for Dr. Baumgarth as well as yourself. Uh, is, is an implication, a logical implication of, of your work, given the heterogeneity of immune response for reasons that are not fully understood yet, uh, that the likelihood is that um, serology will always be problematic? <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, there's there's some level of, of, of truth to that, and um, we need to we need to screen every single protein uh, that Borrelia makes for antibody responses before we um, before we make that judgment. But um, I, I definitely would support kind of a different two-tier approach where we use serology and something else. Um, it would be wonderful to try to you know pick up shed antigens in the blood or DNA, shed DNA in the blood. And I think we're um, probably close to that. Uh, but definitely, um, I don't think it's going to be a one-size-fits-all diagnostic test. 